I feel like this was like a perfect deal for your inaugural year as, as, as head of climate. But, but why now? Why this type of big transform transformational M&A? Yeah, it was always part of the plan, of course. Um, <laughs> no, listen, if you look, take a step back at how we've built our firm over the last 40 years, is we found a very big theme behind the digital innovation and digital economy, and we've been backing that theme, and it's helped us build a global business. And we started to poke around where we thought there were other meaningful themes that could, one, drive great investor performance and good opportunity for investment. And this energy transition is one that is, is often spoken about, but is of a tremendous opportunity and scale. Um, and so... We think it's the next leg of growth for several years. The need, by the way, is, is tremendous. I think you can, you've seen the numbers in, in the statistics, whether it's a trillion a year or three trillion a year, not all of that is going to be adapted to PE-type returns. Mm. But we think it's an opportunity to build a very special franchise. Are you looking at buying anything else similar? I think we need to, so we think we've found some, a group of people and a product that's really special with the Actis team. We've known them for years. Uh, if you look at how differentiated they are in emerging market, it fits our profile really well. So mm. we want to make this really successful. And, and I'll answer that question next year. Okay, perfect. Well, you'll have to join us for that. We'll hold you to it, Gabe. Look, 2023, it was the first year in 10 that deal volume was less mm -hmm. than $3 trillion. I mean, it was talked about a lot. You and I talked about it in Berlin last year. It was a tough year. Is 2024 the year of comeback, or is it another slog? You know, it's interesting. I think people often try to read the in-betweens between public markets and private markets. And obviously, I think what affects private market deal flow most is volatility. Uh, for the simple reason that buyers and sellers don't seem to get along on pricing when volatility is so high. And so I, I think 2022 is the ultimate example of that. And you saw deal flow really collapse. I think 2023, we saw a rebound in, uh, in a lot of programs like ours that are not <clears throat> rate sensitive or credit sensitive. We were back to investing over $6 billion. I think people are starting this year with a much more constructive approach to deal making. Now, some of that is pressures in sellers. And some of that is a hope that capital markets are going to reopen and that can be a real stimulus. Gabe, good morning to you. Good to have you with us uh, and thanks morning. for joining. In terms of where you go next, uh, Danny and I talk about the Inflation Reduction Act here. Well, I'm in New York. She's coming soon. Mm -hmm. What, $110 billion worth of clean energy deals got done in the first year's anniversary. And we're curious to know to what extent will the U.S. play a much bigger landing ground for you in this, in this clean energy manufacturing and the opportunities here in the U.S.? Yeah, listen, it's a, it's a great question. I'd, I'd start by saying we think it's a completely global opportunity and actually the need for electrification and clean and sustainable electri electricity is a completely global uh, event. And so when you look at Actis, the platform we're buying, where they're differentiated is they've operated in emerging markets um, for 40 years of their history, including creating more than 30 gigawatts of clean and sustainable energy in emerging markets. That said, the biggest market in the world is the U.S. And so um, you would expect that there's going to be a lot of deal activity around that. I think there's a danger of relying on incentives from whether it's yep. the Inflation Reduction Act or any other support, right? I think we want to build an investment program and product that will deliver great returns for investors independent of what legislation helps. Okay, and we'll see, we'll see how that maybe changes next year. Um, we brought you on to break a little bit of news, so I hope you do. Um, <laughs> reports are that you uh, have confidentially filed for your IPO. Can you confirm that, or when would you like to go public in, uh, in an optimistic world? Listen, I think, I think if you take a step back and look at what's happened in the private equity industry in the last several years, it, it's not different than many other services industries, which is it was a period of massive expansion, right? I think now the private equity market manages something like $13 trillion, mm -hmm. and it was less than a trillion not that long ago. Uh, and the number of actors in the market has ballooned from maybe five or 600 to thousands. Um, and so I think more than the catalyst of the IPO, I think we're going to go through a phase of restructuring of our industry. And you're going to see winners emerge, and you're going to see people who can't differentiate themselves get consolidated. Uh, we think we want to be one of those winners, and we think that uh, as a result, the industry structure is just going to change completely. Now, I think on the IPO market, to me, the, the, the more interesting debate really is, is are the markets going to reopen? Are we finally going to get back to a favorable capital market setting? Because the last two years have been very tough in particular in our sectors in the tech industry. It's a debate, but we really want to know if you're going public. 
<laughs> I can't comment. Okay, fair enough. Look, well, in terms of the IPO markets reopening, I know one of your portfolio companies, Shein, there's mm -hmm. a lot of excitement about this. Finally, another big IPO coming into the market. There was some Bloomberg reporting that investors are selling at a 30% discount before the IPO. Is there some concern that maybe you won't get the valuation that was initially promised from this fast fashion gi giant? Listen, I can tell you, so Shein, uh, so I think we have a number of companies that are preparing to go public, and it'll depend really on can we see some stability in capital markets, uh, in particular in the high growth and tech sectors, because there have been very few anchor IPOs that have driven investor confidence. So, so we're hopeful for that. Shein's a fantastically performing business. So uh, it continues to grow extremely fast. It's globalizing extremely fast. We think it'll be a, a very successful offering. Um, and, and here's the question, where you, you know, the IPO market, there is this battleground between London and New York. There's a bigger depth here. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's perhaps better valuation. Just look at Birkenstock and, and look at, D, you know, DMs. Uh, there is a difference. So for you, how do you see New York relative to the LSE, relative to Europe? Is it higher price, deeper pools of capital? Is this the number one destination for you? That has been the case historically, and, and actually, Manus, I think it's, it's even more pronounced not in companies of the scale of a Shein or some of the very large businesses. I think what's been a real challenge for investors is the mid-market. Uh, the mid-market in Europe right now is, is, is a completely illiquid market, and that means that you have some wonderful companies who've listed themselves, trusted their capital structure to the public markets, mm -hmm. and are now seeing no liquidity, no support on valuation, no support to do anything. That, that to us in Europe has been a real concern. Um, we've had wildly successful IPOs in Europe, like Adyen in, in Holland or, or others. But we have a whole list of companies today in our portfolio that we think are special businesses that want to go public. And unfortunately, even if they're domiciled in Europe, they are considering the U.S. markets because they're perceived as deeper, better understanding of tech sectors, and as, as a result, rewarding companies with better value. Yeah, I mean, we see that again and again. The Arm IPO, yeah. a great example of one big, I mean, U.K.-rooted company that went to the U.S. Now, so you mentioned you have some companies you want to take public this year. Is there something specific you're waiting for to jump back into the IPO market, or is it just there's a timeline you've set up, it's going to happen this year? I think what we worry most about is IPO for us is not an exit moment, right? The truth is you're just starting the next journey of a company's story, right? And so what you really want is to build the right book of investors that are going to support you throughout long periods of time. And I think we, the tech industry in particular, has learned a really valuable lesson in 2020 and 2021 where you saw a, an avalanche of IPOs. And, and if you're honest about it today, a lot of those companies should have never gone public. They were too young, too small, weren't prepared for the scrutiny of public markets. I, I heard Manus make a comment, I think it was maybe you, that unfortunately today's market, when you have a bad quarter, and a bad quarter qualified as not beating estimates, you get punished really badly. When yeah. you're a young growth company, it is really hard to predict a year in advance. Right. It's really, really hard. And so I think what we're waiting for is a real buy-in from long-term institutional investors that they're willing to back our companies through growth acceleration. I mentioned Xi'an. You also have uh, quite a few different Chinese assets, mm -hmm. ByteDance as well. We've seen this period in China right now where policymakers are doing a lot to try to re-instill yeah. some sense of, of confidence among investors. How confident are you in China right now? Would you be as confident as to look for more assets to buy there? Yeah. Listen, we've been in China um, almost 25 years. It's been a fantastic market for us. We've had great success and performance there. Uh, and um, I think if you are able to put aside some of the bi perceived binary risk of geopolitics, it is probably the best growth buy that you'll see, right? B because investors have fled the country for, yes. for understandable reasons, um, we continue to maintain a very constructive approach to that market. Of course, there are certain industries that right now are, are really difficult to assess, uh, but we believe that there's an opportunity to make tremendous returns in the market. And I think you have to put in perspective what China's been through. Yes, it, it, it looks cataclysmic. It's still growing 5%. There's still a very powerful consumer market, uh, and that's what we're aiming.